Hi, and welcome to this Network Plus training video dealing with network media. Now, this is part one of a two-part series on network media. In this video, we're going to cover some terminology dealing with network media concepts. We'll talk about wired media, a couple of different types, coaxial cable, fiber optic cable, among, among uh, a few others. We'll talk about plenum, the area known as the plenum, and why you should be concerned with it. We'll talk about LAN technologies, again, local area network technologies, Ethernet, fast Ethernet, and gigabit Ethernet. We'll also talk about several types of connectors that you need to be aware of when talking about these different uh, types of cables and so forth. And then we'll also cover wiring standards, the TIA, EIA, 568A, and 568B. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so with network media, we have different categories of cabling. Now what you see here in the graphic is a twisted pair cable, a CAT5 cable, very typical to find in an Ethernet modern network. However, there are some other categories of cable that you'll, you'll come across. Now CAT3, as you see, is a 10 megabit per second cable. That is not used in modern networks at all. It's too slow. But if you run into an older building, if, you know, if you're working in somewhere that has maybe some older wiring, there may be CAT3 cable, a lot of, you know, phone wire basically, you know, ten, uh, CAT3 cable. Uh, it's not used though in a modern network. So we're going to focus on CAT5 and above. CAT5 has 100 megabit per second throughput, CAT5e 1000 megabits per second or gigabit, and CAT6 also rated for gigabit. So just kind of keep those terms in mind. Again, we're just covering some terminology at this point. Now, something that you need to be aware of with wired media is the concept of attenuation. And attenuation is, as we have laid out here, it's signal degradation over distance. So a twisted pair cable suffers from attenuation beyond 100 meters or 328 feet. Now, the twists, and hence the term twisted, uh, twisted pair, the twists that are actually inside the cable for each pair, the twist per inch, the more twists, the less crosstalk or the less interference. All right, it doesn't really uh, do anything for us as far as attenuation is concerned, but when it comes to uh, interference and crosstalk, in other words, if you have two cables next to each other, you know, you run two cables side by side, they give off a little bit of, of, uh, of the energy of the electrical impulses that flow down the cable. They kind of go off a little bit um, outside of the cable itself. Not much, but enough so that if the cables are side by side close enough, you can get something referred to as crosstalk. Even with the, ca even the, uh, the, the pairs of, of wires inside the cable, again, could be susceptible to crosstalk. So the twists inside... Uh, basically disrupt that and reduce the level of crosstalk. But getting back to attenuation, uh, attenuation basically, again, I'll bring up my cursor here for a second, it is, you know, the amplitude and the distance. The amplitude is how strong is that signal? And again, we're sending digital information, so it's ones and zeros, it's binary information. So where you see this spike go up, that would be representative of a one. As it drops down, a zero, a one, a zero, a one and zero. So as you see over distance, that signal gets weak enough to the point where you can no longer distinguish and there's no amplitude on, on the wire. So basically the information gets lost. So if two hosts on a network are far enough apart electronically, okay, be beyond this 328 foot um, delineation, if we go beyond that, then what happens is they're so far apart electronically they can't hear each other communicate. Or at the very least, they're so far apart that one begins to communicate, the other machine doesn't actually realize that uh, the first machine is, is communicating or talking, so it starts to talk, potentially, and that can cause cre or create collisions on the network. All right, we'll talk more about that in, in a few, but for now, just understand the basic concept of, a si of signal attenuation. The amplitude over distance degrades to the point where it's, it's either gone completely or it's really kind of unusable. Okay, so now as far as network cabling is concerned, I mentioned we have twisted pair cables. There are two types of twisted pair cables okay, that we need to know about, and that is unshielded twisted pair and shielded twisted pair. On the left-hand side, I have shielded twisted pair, and you can see the individual shielding around each twisted pair. And then on the, on the right-hand side, we have unshielded twisted pair, which is probably what you're more familiar with. Uh, you may come across shielded twisted pair in certain situations. However, for most implementations, for most uh, wiring in a typical building, you're going to run across UTP. Why? 
basically it comes down to cost. Shielded twisted pair is three to four times more expensive than unshielded twisted pair. Again, you know, it depends on where you buy it from and so forth. But generally speaking, you know, it's three to four times more expensive. So if you have to buy, you know, a thousand feet and you want to pay a hundred dollars for shielded twisted pair, I'm sorry, for unshielded twisted pair, you can expect to pay 300, 350, maybe $400 for shielded twisted pair. Now, if, if you're in an environment though, however, where you need that extra shielding, you need to protect against something called electromagnetic interference or EMI, then STP is obviously the way to go. Now, what would be a situation where you would have EMI and you may need to protect against it? Well, it depends on, again, the building that you're working in or the room or what have you. But if you need to run cables across, let's say you have uh, fluorescent lights in the ceiling or you have power cables, you know, either in a wall or run, running through the ceiling or what have you, and you have it to the point where those uh, twisted pair of cables have to go in close proximity or perhaps even run across uh, the, you know, those things, whether fluorescent lights, what have you, then that EMI is given off and it degrades the signal. All right, so it can really slow down your network, even bring it to a halt, depending on how bad that EMI is. So in those instances, yes, then, you know, the extra cost is warranted. And, you know, depending on how bad the EMI is, it may be an out outright necessity. So just keep in mind uh, the two types. Nine times out of ten, you'll run into UT uh, UDP, UTP rather, when you're out in the field. Now, as I mentioned before, twisted pair cabling, common ones we'll run across are CAT 3, 5, 5E, and 6. Cat 3, not so much, as I said before. Cat 5 and up uh, is what we're going to come in contact with. They all use the same type of connector, and that is an RJ45 connector. So an RJ45 connector, as you can see in the graphic here, looks very much like an RJ11 connector. An RJ11 is a common phone cord connector. It's just bigger. All right, so you can kind of think of it as the big brother uh, to, a phone, to a phone cord. Now, whereas a phone cord has four wires, two or four, a CAT5 cable, CAT5, uh, CAT5E rather, or CAT6, we're going to have eight wires or four pair. All right, and you can see it comes in various colors. We have some, and I'll bring up my cursor again. We have some uh, CAT5 cables or CAT whatever cables that have these little boots on them, and they're typically found in patch cables. So that way, when you plug it into the to the switch, and you're constantly pulling them in and out. Uh, it, it protects this little tab from getting snagged when you're pulling it out of something, because a lot of times these will get broken off. All right, so there's different types of boots. You can have uh, ones with no boots, especially if you're if you're uh, creating your own cables. All right, now these nothing wrong with it doesn't make it any more uh, doesn't make it any faster doesn't make it necessarily a better cable. It just protects the metal tab from being pulled off. Okay, some additional network cabling that we need to be aware of. We have coaxial cable, or otherwise known as coax. Now there's a couple of different types of coax cable. It's not on the Network Plus exam anymore. It's been dropped as of the most recent uh, version, so you don't really need to spend too much time on this. However, I would familiarize yourself with it just for your own knowledge because you will run across it uh, potentially when you're out in the field, and it, it would serve you well to at least have a general understanding of what it is. Now, coaxial cable, again, thin net or RG58, otherwise known as 10 base, T, or 10 base 2. Now, let me just stop for one second uh, here and explain what these things mean. When you see 10 base or 100 base or 1000 base, um, and then some delineation over here, it's going to mean a couple of different things. The 10, in this case, that's the speed of the network or the speed of the wire. All right, so it's a 10 megabit per second. It's baseband, which means it's digital. And then the two is the distance of that cable, the max distance of that cable. Now, when this first came out, it was, was first spec'd out, 10 base 2, it was actually supposed to go 200 meters, and realistically it ended up at, uh, maxing out at about 185 meters. So rather than call it 10 base 185, they just went with 10 base 2. All right, just for your own knowledge. 10 base 2 has a maximum distance of 185 meters and uses a connector that's referred to as a BNC connector or a bayonet style connector or a British naval connector. Okay, there's a couple different... Um, you know, schools of thought as to what BNC actually stands for. The BNC connector itself, which is down here in the corner, that's going to screw down onto the connection that that you're uh, connecting it to, and it locks into place. So you can see right here uh, the, these two little holes or two little side pieces. There's little slots that uh, stick out on the actual connector that you're connecting to. They'll slide into th this little crevice, and then it uh, you can see a little 
channel right here. And as you screw that connector down, it takes that little post that's sticking out from the connector and it basically draws it up into this channel and locks the connector down nice and tight on the, um, on the connector that you're connecting to. All right, so it basically just screws down uh, onto the connection and just keeps it tight. All right, again, not, not on the Network Plus exam anymore, so don't spend too much time with it, but I do want you just to understand, um, you know, just the, the basics of it. Now, there are a couple other types, RG59 and RG6, which are cable television and satellite cabling, um, which, I, which you know, I'm showing down here in the bottom right-hand corner. Very, very similar to ThinNet. Um, it's just the specs are a little bit different. The actual, uh, um, you know, specifics about these two different types of cable are slightly different. Don't need to know it for the exam. So, you know, we'll leave it at that for now. Now, as far as the parts of the cable or what makes up a coaxial cable, uh, we just need to understand that it's very ins it's insulated and it's very durable. So it has a solid copper core, typically. Sometimes you'll find it with a stranded center, but nine times out of 10, it's gonna be a solid copper core. Then it has some insulating material that goes around uh, the copper core. And then you'll have some type of braided metal shielding, which is this piece here. And then you'll have a jacket, okay, an additional um, insulator. And what that does, again, is it does a very good job of shielding against EMI or electromagnetic interference. Okay, to expand just a little bit more, uh, we have, as I mentioned, thin net, 10 base 2, 185 meters max length, and a BNC connector. There's another type, which is even older than thin net and even more <laughs> not in use anymore, and that's thick net. All right, that's, that's referred to as 10 base 5. That had a 500 meter max length, and we use things called vampire taps to actually connect uh, devices to the, the, this thick net cabling. So a vampire tap was a device that kind of clamped around this actual cable. So it actually clamped onto the cable, the outside of it, like this. And there was a little pierce that was inside of that tap. So as you screwed the tap down onto the cable, that pierce actually stuck into the cable. And it pierced the, uh, the outer jacket and pierced into the copper core. And that's how you actually, you know, tied into that network. So if you've ever worked with it, you would see that, you know, every three meters or so, there'd be like a little black stripe on the cable that would let you know, you know, where you could basically, uh, you know, tie into that cable. Um, it's not used in today's networks. It was typically used as a backbone in some of the older networks that are out there. Um, is there a chance you'll run across it if you go into some uh, antiquated network? Sure, there's a chance. But as far as a Network Plus exam, uh, exam is concerned, we don't need to, to really know about it. So don't spend too much time other than to just, you know, like I said before, to familiarize yourself with it. Okay, next type of cable, fiber optic cabling. Now this, you do need to know for the exam. It is in use very much in modern networks. And uh, something that we need to just kind of have a good understanding of just from a, a base level. Are you going to go out and become a fiber optic technician? Chances are no. To be a Network Plus technician or, be a, or to be net, uh, excuse me, Network Plus certified, you don't need to know how to actually, you know, cut and splice and burnish the ends of a fiber optic cable and so forth. So, you know, you see some of these things, don't get too um, intimidated or, you know, think you're going to have to know how to do all of these things. A lot of this is simply so that you can have an educated discussion. Let's say, for instance, you go into a network or you go into a company and you're going to be doing some networking, either administration or some type of you know, work for them. You need to understand that if you have a fiber optic uh, need, a need for fiber optic cable, rather, you need to be able to have an educated discussion with a fiber tech that comes out. So that's more or less what some of these things are uh, on the exam for, just so you have a very good understanding of what it is and how to communicate when you need, you know you have to express a need to one of the uh, specific um, specialists or experts that have to come in and perhaps work with you on a job. So at any rate, you know I get off on a tangent once in a while, but um, fiber optic cabling it transmits light as you may you may have guessed instead of electrical impulses. So you know since it's not electrical impulses, it's not affected by EMI or electromagnetic interference or crosstalk. And it can also travel very long distances. So we're basically shooting light down a, a piece of glass, right? This little uh, piece over here. These are glass fibers or, or a glass core. And light shoots down that, very, as you can imagine, extremely fast um, and very reliably. And it can go very long distances. So there are four components in a fiber optic cable. We have the fiber core. You have the cladding, which 
is responsible really for bouncing the light down the fiber, uh, the piece of fiber, the fiber core. You can almost think of it as like a mirrored finish. The inside of this cladding has a has a mirrored finish. So as the light shoots down the uh, the fiber core, it kind of bounces off or reflects off the inside of that cladding as it goes down the line. And then we have a buffer material, which is used to give additional strength, and then an insulating jacket, right? So protected from the elements and so forth. Now, fiber optic cabling is typically implemented with a pair of fiber, uh, basically running in duplex. So you'll have one cable for sending and one cable for receiving. Uh, fiber optic cables come in two types, and we need to understand both of these, multi-mode and single mode. In multi-mode, or a multi-mode fiber uh, cable uses LED or a light emitting diode, so it uses LED light to shoot light down the cable, whereas single mode uses laser light. Laser can just travel much farther distances than the LED can. So when you're, you know, if you're ever posed with a question or what have you, like what's what's better in a long distance implementation, single mode is going to be, uh, you know, more of a, a correct choice for long distance runs than than multi mode. All right, something else. As far as uh, fiber cable modes are concerned, I just wanted to kind of point out to you, we have here we have multi-mode, and this is actually looking at the cable directly head on. All right, so with multi-mode, these two here, we have the cladding, which is this outer jacket. All right, the cladding, like I said, it has the mirrored finish on the inside and uh, wraps around the, the core. So as you see, this is the LED. Again, we're using multi-mode, so it would be an LED as the source. And as it shoots light or emits light, it bounces off the inside of that cladding and shoots down the cable. Again, here in multi-mode, again, another example, LED, just a slightly different type of, of uh, implementation. But again, the light rays go in a slightly different pattern. But again, they're bouncing off the cladding as it shoots down the line. And then in single mode, we have a much, you know, you have a thicker cladding, um, smaller, metal, I'm sorry, a smaller uh, fiber core, but we're shooting a laser light. So the laser just shoots straight down, straight down the line. All right, so it can go much further distances. Now with fiber optic connections, we have to be aware of a couple different types of connectors. There are a lot of connectors when it comes to fiber optic cabling. There are three uh, main ones that are required for the NetPlus exam. And that is an ST connector, an SC connector, and an LC connector. Now, an LC connector accepts two fiber cables. So that's how you can uh, usually tell those apart from everything else, right? So you can see what I have here. We have an ST cable, an SC, right? The STs screw down onto um, the device. SCs click into place. Again, ST and SC again, just different, uh, slightly different types. And then an LC connector has the two cables, all right? So as you see, Screw down, click in, and then dual. So as you see over here, we have two cables. And again, these are two separate cables. Don't get confused and think they're together. Two separate cables. What type of connector? Since it screws down, we're looking at an ST connector. Okay, now to, to jump back uh, in time a little bit again, um, there's another type of cable and another type of connection that we need to be aware of, and that's a serial connection. It's not used as a networking cable per se, but there are devices that still use RS-232 or serial connections. You may, be, uh, you may be in a shop or somewhere where they have a couple of devices, especially like equipment um, shops where they use uh, different types of um, devices like in construction or some type of uh, you know, tool or die shop. They may have a device that's controlled via a serial cable. So the standard is RS-232. It was created back in the late 60s. Hasn't really changed much since then sometimes used to connect devices to a PC. Uh, most newer PCs, however, don't even have RS-232 ports on the back or serial ports on the back anymore. Everything else, everything's using USB nowadays. Uh, but just something to be, that you need to, to uh, be aware of is the fact that on the ends of these cables, we have what's called a DB connector. Now, some serial cables, RS-232, you'll have a DB9, where you'll have nine pins on the connector. Now, as far as the actual type of connector, you can see here that this end has connectors with metal pins inside. So the pins are the posts that stick out. That means it's a male connector. On this end, we have 
a connector that has holes that the pins stick into. So this is a female connector, or you can kind of think of them as being anatomically correct, so to speak. So that's just an easy way to tell them apart. Now, along that same vein, we have parallel connections. Again, not really used that much anymore, but still need to be aware of them. Uh, primarily used to connect to older printers. It's an IEEE 1284 is the standard that applies to parallel connections. And more often than not, you'll find a 25 pin female connection or, well, let me actually pull my cursor up, this um, 25 pin female connection. Okay, it's DB25. Or you may see a Centronics connection, which is these type here. Okay, these types of connections um, connect to the printer. There's like little clips on either side that just hold this in place. Whereas the DB connectors have these little posts on the back that screw down and, uh, and screw these little screws into the PC or whatever you're connecting to. So that holds it in place. So, but just a couple of different types of, of uh, parallel connections to be aware of. Um, now, as you may or may not have given any thought, in a serial connection, the data travels serially or one bit at a time one bit right behind the other, kind of like, you know, ants marching in a row one by one. In a parallel connection, obviously, as the name implies, data is traveling in parallel. So you, ha you may have, you know, 8-bit or 16-bit, so you can have 8 bits in parallel running at the same time, or 16-bit, you know, it depends on the implementation. But just understand the basic differences between serial and parallel. One is one bit at a time. Parallel can do however many bits wide that data path is. It can do that many uh, bits at a time. All right, now jumping back into the modern time, uh, let's take a look at FireWire. Now, FireWire is a point-to-point -point connection, meaning you don't necessarily need to plug it into a PC first. Like with USB, um, you have to actually, you know, if you want to connect two devices or what have you, you need that intermediary or the hub, you need a PC uh, to plug into. With FireWire, you don't necessarily need that. You can plug directly from a camera to a printer or a camera to a hard drive or what, you know, whatever the two devices are, they can connect directly. FireWire is very fast, speeds up to 800 megabits per second. Uh, it's not used for networking itself per se. In fact, with Vista, uh, FireWire as a networking technology or as a networking uh, option has been removed. However, it's used quite a bit when we're talking about connecting devices that require a high throughput like digital video cameras. So you'll see that um, a lot in the digital video, video editing, graphic design, those types of firms use FireWire quite a bit. Now the standard that applies to that is the IEEE 1394. And it'll sometimes be referred to as iLink. That was Sony's uh, term for it initially. So if you hear that term, you can kind of just understand that it is, you know, the same thing we're talking about FireWire. Now, speaking of fire, <laughs> how's that for a segue? Uh, we have fire ratings. Now, the Underwriters Laboratories, or UL, and the National Electrical Code, NEC, developed a cable fire rating system. So there's two main categories uh, of cabling. One is UL rated, or basically fire rated. The other is not. PVC, or po polyvinyl chloride, is what you're going to find on a typical UTP or STP cable. So you go out to your local uh, networking shop or you order online, you get a thousand feet of Cat5 cable. Nine times out of ten, unless you specifically order a plenum grade cable, you're going to end up with PVC coating or PVC jacket on the outside. It's not fire rated because if it burns, it gives off a noxious fume. Smoke, quite a bit of smoke and noxious fumes. Plenum grade cable, however, does not do that. It's very low smoke and it does not give off those types of fumes. All right, so you may say, well, so what? What's what's the big deal? What is plenum? I've never even heard of it before. Well, the plenum is the actual uh, space between the ceiling tiles and the actual ceiling, or it could be the floor, like if you have a raised floor. So as you may guess, that space between where your ceiling tiles are in, in a corporate or a business uh, environment, that space between where the ceiling tiles are and the actual ceiling itself is where you have air ducts and you have, you know, different things that, that allow airflow between rooms in the building, between floors in the building. So you don't want cabling running through those areas that can burn in the event of a fire and give off high, high amounts of smoke and noxious fumes. Because what happens as soon as that burns and gives off all that smoke and those noxious fumes in that plenum area, it, it, it goes right into the duct work and it can spread throughout the entire building. 
So other rooms within that building that may not even be on fire yet, all of a sudden you have all this smoke and, and fumes and so forth going into these other rooms and it can, you know, put other people in danger much more quickly than, you know, if you didn't have that. So most city ordinances require plenum grade cabling for network installations, okay, and the plenum risers between the floors. So definitely make yourself uh, um, familiar with it. Plenum grade cabling, again, is more expensive, but if, if your code requires it, put it in, okay? It's much easier to justify spending the money up front versus having the fire marshal or somebody come in, find out that it's not plenum grade cable and make you rip, rip everything out and then, you know, put in new. So the graphic here that you see, I just highlighted the two areas that are the plenum. All right, here we have a typical office building. You know, people at their desks and their cubicles and so forth. Well, the ceiling tiles are here. We have light fixtures and so forth. There's actually, you know, the space between the ceiling tiles and the actual floor itself. All right, so that would be the, called the plenum. That's where you have airflow. Same thing in the bottom here. We have a raised floor or it could be, you know, the, uh, the ceiling from the floor below. That space there, again, the plenum area, you have to have cabling that is plenum rated uh, when you're running cables through those locations. Okay, now when it comes to wiring, we have some standards that we need to be aware of. Uh, the TIA, EIA, the Telecommunications Industry Association slash Electronics Industries Alliance, that's a mouthful for you, <laughs> the TIA, EIA, came up with two standards for the proper wiring or crimping of four pair UTP cable, all right, the 568A and 568B. So you're typically just going to be, you're going to hear it referred to either by those two uh, terms, 568A or B. So it's basically the color codes defining the order or the placement of the wires into the uh, RJ45 jack itself, all right? So let's take a little bit um, deeper look at this. The TIA-EIA standards, again, 568A adopted in the mid-90s, 568B kind of replaced the uh, 568A in 2002. So as you see here, we have a Cat5 cable, and inside there are four pair of wires, okay, eight wires total. You'll have orange, orange with a white stripe, and you, you'll see it wrapped around the orange. You have green and green with a white stripe, blue, blue with a white stripe, and brown, brown with a white stripe. Now, sometimes you'll buy cable, and I hate when it <laughs> works out this way, but sometimes, you know, you don't know until you get it, you buy it and you take it out and you start to use it. A lot of times they may, um, especially if it's cheaper cable, you'll have, you know, obviously the orange, green, brown, and blue wires, but the white wires, or the white with a stripe, instead of it being white with brown stripe or white with blue stripe, you know, et cetera, it'll just be white and it'll be wrapped around. And then when you go to un unravel them, as we'll, you know, explain here in a minute, and you go to stick it into the RJ45 connector and do your crimping, if you have those types of wires and they come apart in your hand or you, you know, you, you mess it up a little bit, it's almost impossible to figure out <laughs> which white wire that went to initially. So you got to cut the end off and start over again. So just a you know, word of advice, if, if you have an opportunity to examine the wire or the cabling rather before you buy it, if you have to go out and buy some, some cable, make sure that it is striped. You know, it's not just a solid white cable or a solid white wire rather. So at any rate, again, I'm digressing here just a bit. Um, let's go and look at the 568A and B wiring um, description. And you'll notice as we go through this that what's basically happening here is... The difference between the A and the B is simply the green and the orange have been replaced or reversed. So in the 568A implementation, we have white, green, green, white, orange, blue, uh, white, blue, orange, white, brown, and brown. In the 568B wiring, we have white, orange, orange. So instead of white, green, green, we have white, orange, orange. Instead of white, orange, orange, we have white, green, green. All right. So they're, they're basically just reversed. The blue and white blue are still the same and white, brown, and brown are still the same. Okay. 568B again is the more common uh, format. Truth be told, you could wire this any which way you want. 
as long as it's the same on both sides, as long as you're consistent throughout your entire implementation. I don't recommend that at all because if you ever have to go back and redo something or somebody else wants to come in and they go to the, and they use the standard, it's not going to work, right? So uh, word of advice, always use one of these two when you're wiring your, your cables or, or uh, creating your cables. I would recommend using 568B uh, just as it's, it's the more standard uh, use, you know, these days. Now, just to look at it again in more detail, we have the TIA, EIA standards, again, A and B. This is the RJ45 connector that you're familiar with. Here's where the cable would come in. And you'll notice now, this is what happens. You have to unravel the twists, straighten them out, and then you're going to cut them so they're nice and straight across. You insert the cable into the RJ45 connector, and it has to go again in this specific order, white, green, green, white, orange, blue, white, blue, orange, white, brown, brown. Okay? For a B implementation, it'd be white, orange, orange, white, green, blue, white, blue, green, white, brown, brown. So you stick it in, make sure that they, they line up into the channels correctly, and then you stick the RG45 connector into your crimping tool, crimp it down, and it basically crimps right into here and makes the connection. All right? So this is just showing you on this, these numbers over here is just basically showing you, you know, the pairs of wires, what pairs they are. So you have, you know, one, two, three, and four. You can just see where they're reversed between A and B. So it sounds a little bit confusing at first. After you've done it once or twice, it's actually kind of fun to crimp your own ca cables. I wouldn't necessarily want to do it, you know, a hundred times a day, but it's nice in the fact that if you ever have one of the RJ45 connectors come off of a cable, you know, maybe, uh, you know, either home or at work, you don't necessarily have to throw the whole cable out or go buy a new one or use a new one. You can just cut the end off, strip uh, the, uh, the outer jacket off, wire your own connector and crimp it and you're good to go. So the other advantage is you can, you can make the cabling the exact length or, you know, give yourself a little bit of extra room, but you can make it the proper length. So you don't have to have necessarily, you know, 5, 10, 15 feet coiled up uh, in the corner somewhere where it's not, you know, extra cabling. So it's nice. It just makes it much, makes it for a much more professional implementation. And again, you save money. It's cheaper. Uh, it is a little bit more work, but, you know, it's, it's something I would recommend everybody, especially a Network Plus uh, technician, to get in the habit of at least, you know, every so often crimping your own, your own uh, Cat5 cable just so you keep in practice and so that you understand, you know, how it's done. Okay, in this Network Plus uh, video series, we covered terminology. We covered wired media, including coaxial and fiber optic cable. We talked about the area known as the plenum, that area where you have the duct work and the airflow above and below an office space. We talked about LAN technologies, including Ethernet, fast Ethernet, and gigabit Ethernet. 10 megabits per second, 100 megabits per second, and 1,000 megabits per second, respectively. We talked about different types of connectors for uh, coaxial and fiber optic cables, and also for the you know, Cat5 and Cat6 type cables. We also covered the wiring standards from the TIA, EIA, the 568A, and 568B. So I hope this video was enjoyable for you. I'd like to thank you very much for watching.